Hello, hello, and welcome to the Sober Bartender Podcast, the show where we recover from life. I'm your host, Brandy Kelly. Today, I have a guest for you. I have Randy Prince here. Welcome, Randy. Hi, everybody. So Randy is the admissions manager at Ripple Ranch Recovery, and that's here in Texas, correct? Yes, ma'am. It's in Spring Spring Branch, Texas. Okay. And what do y'all do there? So we're actually, we're actually, <laughs> a, <laughs> we're actually um, a recovery center. We uh, specialize in substance abuse and mental health as well. That's awesome because a lot of times our substance abuse goes hand in hand with mental health most, issues. Most definitely. Like um, it's definite. I am a strong believer also because I am a, um, an alumni of Ripple Ranch. So I actually mm-hmm. uh, was a client of theirs a little less than three years ago. And um, because of, of that, we dive so deep into mental health. That's and I strongly believe that that's why I'm so strong in my, my recovery. You know, um, I'm a strong believer in the 12 steps. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, sometimes some of us need a little bit more, you know, we have trauma, we have, um, mental, mental health issues that, that we're dealing with. And, um, you know, I mean, let's be honest, you know, um, our fellow AA, AAers or NAers, you know, they're not professionals. And sometimes we need that little bit of, um, help professionally and, man, it, it definitely helped me. Like I always tell my clients, I, what I did was I took the 12 steps and I took, um, my mental health, what I learned at ripple and just combine this, this recovery shield. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. And it's so true. Um, like I, I I'm this, the 12 steps saved my life. I, you know, I've taken them multiple times on different journeys in recovery. Um, Mm -hmm. And I don't currently, I'm not currently um, in 12 step recovery. I'm actually in recovery Dharma, but I'm still Mm -hmm. an advocate for the steps because they absolutely work. They do save your life. And also there are wonderful things that sometimes we need in addition to those steps, like that go hand in hand, like you said. So hearing like, in looking at Ripple Ranch, um, like it said that it's individualized treatment. And I was like, oh, that's wonderful. As opposed to just like that blanket of treatment that gets put on every single person that goes into a rehab center. Yes. And that's where sometimes, you know, with those ones that have like a blanket, like you have to hit, you know, your fourth step before you can move on to the next level, you know, in treatment, sometimes that doesn't work for, for clients. And that's what I love about our facility is that, you know, we are a smaller facility. So, so we are able to take that time to, to individualize each, you know, each person's treatment because everybody's different. Everybody comes from different walks of life. And, um, and then what, what's amazing to watch is these, and, and it was the same thing for me when I went to treatment, you know, like you're put in this environment where you're with, you have, you have a roommate that out on the outside, you would have never given them the time of day, right? Cause you're mm-hmm. two completely different people, but now you're on the same playing field and you really get to know that person. And you guys start, you know, talking about like the traumas you've been through or what you deal with in, in your families and you connect on a different level. And be, I mean, I still have lifelong friends from rehab. Yeah. And so obviously you had a great experience because now that is, that's where you work. Like you get to go and give back and help other people find that same experience that you found. And it, yes. And it is so rewarding for me and it's such a different experience in admissions because like we're on the front line, right? We are the very first people that they talk to when they're in crisis and man, it re- it reminds me on a daily basis of where I was because I was that person. And then it also helps me with my compassion and my empathy, because, you know, I'm not going to lie. There are some days where I get super frustrated and, you know, you're dealing with a, a hard client, you know, that, and then you have to remind yourself, you know, like 
they're not, they're not well, they're in crisis, they're hurting, they're in pain, you know, like, and it takes me back to that day when I called in tears, when I, you know, didn't want to answer any questions where I'm just like, I need help. I don't want to go through a screening, you know, and, and it just, it helps me in my recovery to be that light for, for people who are in that dark place that I was in. Yeah. How powerful. I can just imagine how special that you do that. It really is. And then like, you know, it's such an amazing journey to watch them, you know, because I get to to see them when they're when they're first, you know, in crisis. And then you start seeing them blossoming in rehab. And then I get, you know, I'll, I'll go to the alumni meetings and I'll see my clients. And and, you know, I had one she was a young one and, and she didn't know who I was. I just kind of showed up at an alumni meeting and I knew who she was, you know, and I was like, Hey, I was like, I'm Randy. And she just burst into tears and gave me a hug. And I was like, this is why I do what I do. Yeah. You get to see their lights turn on. Yeah. You know, and it's such an amazing, it really is an amazing feeling because I know, I know how, how strong addiction is and how lonely and how broken you feel when you're in the middle of it, you know, and you think you, you think there's no way out and there's nobody understands and nobody's going through what I go through, you know, and, and then you have that one person that you can relate to and it just gives you like a hand, you know, here, I'll help you. And then you just go and it's just, it's just amazing to watch them blossom. It really <laughs> is. I love it. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, when you get when you get like a, a few years of sobriety and recovery and you get some life back and, you know, like like for me and for me personally, like there's some challenges that come my way and there's some ups and downs. And but I feel secure in, you know, walking through whatever comes my way. It's not that I forget what it was like in the beginning but I feel like the tools that I acquired in the beginning are absolutely what I lean on every single day of my recovery. So do you want to talk a little bit about like what happens when we first get sober and why it's so important to not just not drink or not use drugs? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think it's hilarious when people, when people sit there and say, oh, just say no, you know, just don't drink, just don't use, you know, and one, and my best friend was one of those, you know, mm -hmm. like where she for a long time thought that it was just as easy as just saying no. And I'm just like, I wish it was that easy. I wish that I could just have that, that power to say no. And, you know, in, when you're first in recovery, like, like, yeah, it, it, you, so you take the drink out, right? Or you take the drug out, but now you're, you have to work through all that mess that you, that was created in your addiction and you, and it's not easy. It, you know, you have to face the, the people that you hurt. You have to really, really look at yourself, you know, um, and be willing to change those things. And, you know, yeah taking the drink is, is out or the drug out is very important, but it, the main, the, the meat of recovery is working on yourself and changing who you are inside. And, um, I love my, my, my dad told me, I was like, yeah, you know, I, I'm a new me. And, and he goes, no, you're the Randy that you always used to be. You're just, you're just a better version of yourself. And I love that because it's true. I always had it in me. It was just, I had this hold over me and it does, it takes having fellowship. It takes being able to pick up a phone when you're hurting. It takes being able to walk away when you're angry, you know, because that was a hard thing for me because, because I, I'm, I have a temper and, you know, I, I'm an Aries, I'm a fiery sign, you know, like, um, I'm very assertive. And, um, so that was one of the things that I worked at uh, when I was at Ripple was I found that my anger was my trigger, right? Like, cause I, I would get angry and then I would be like, F it, you know, F it, F everybody. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to show you, I'm going to go drink, you know? And, and then I blow my life up into pieces 
And once I really sat back and worked through that anger, found out, you know, like where I feel it in my body, the minute it starts, you know, it's crazy now. Like, cause now I get angry and if I'm on the phone, I'll be like, you know what? I need to, I need to call you back. I'm getting angry. You know, like I, I need to call you back or with my husband, you know, like we, we, uh, I'll be like, I have to walk away. <laughs> like, we will revisit this, <laughs> but I have to walk away right now, you know, but that's me working my, my program. That's me knowing myself. And it's not easy to look in that mirror and really get to know you because there was a point in my life where I would look in the mirror and I didn't like who I saw looking back at me and I didn't want to look at her. So I literally like, when I say I couldn't look in the mirror, I would not look in the mirror. I would brush my teeth in the morning to get ready for work. I'd brush my teeth in the morning and then I'd look up real fast and make sure my hair wasn't too much of a mess. And then I was out the door because I didn't like what I saw, you know, but now that I've worked through it and it's not easy, but I did it. I can look in my, the mirror and I love who I, who I see. I have flaws. I make mistakes. I don't do anything perfectly. I don't want to do it perfectly because how boring would that be? But I, to, but today I'm able to make those mistakes and correct them. I'm able to mess up and not think it's the end of the world. And most importantly, I'm, I'm able to go through those things and have life hit me on life's terms and not want to go drink. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like a superpower. <laughs> yeah. Like, like it's crazy because, because I mean, you know, you know, like when we're in our addiction, it didn't matter what happened the the wind could be blowing in the wrong direction and we'd use that as an excuse to go use right i mean this past year has been a whirlwind of emotions for me like from super happy emotions to very very sad emotions and not once did i ever think you know what i'm going to go drink over this. And to me, I am winning at sobriety, you know, because I'm not, I don't have that first thought. Or if I, if I do, if I have like a uneasy feeling, I go to a meeting and that's my medicine, you know, like I, I feel better off by going over there and spilling my guts over there, you know, or, or instead of like, you know, unleashing it all on my husband or my friends or my, you know, you know, or holding it in, I go and I release it, you know, and I, I'll be sitting in a meeting and uh, <clears throat> after like, you know, something happens and so I'm like, I need to go to a meeting and I'll be sitting there and I'm like, I'm in awe at myself because I'm like, remember when you used to go and run to the, the liquor store because something like this would have happened? And then your life would have been in shambles and blown up and wondering how you got there. And now look at you, you're killing it, you know? Yeah, it is incredible. And it's, you know, it's, it was some like, it's something that I talk about often is now going to a meeting is just such an automatic thing. Mm -hmm. But there was probably a time where that felt like a really big, uncomfortable thing. Yes. And it, <clears throat> it was, it was, sorry, <clears throat> there went my voice. Mm -hmm. um, it was uncomfortable because, because especially in early sobriety, because I was still working through, you know, all of that turmoil inside and, and learning how to trust people too at the same time. And, you know, you go to a meeting and they're like, oh yeah, everything stays here. And in my head, I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, we're all people here. Come on now. And, but the more that I went and the more that I felt good afterwards and the more that I started sharing and the more that I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute. Well, if he can share that, well then here, like, let me share this here. Let me just vomit, you know, how I feel and get it out, you know? And the more I did that with no judgment coming back at me, like it, it just felt like 
now it's just second nature. You know, if I need to go into a meeting and cry, or if I need to go in there and share something happy, or, you know, it's like sharing something with your best friend. That's how it feels. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, people on the outside don't necessarily realize what it feels <laughs> like to be in that space of like, okay, life life is good, life is bad, life is chaotic, life is boring, whatever it is, you can just go, I'm going to go sit in here. And these people that are sitting in here aren't going to judge me. And I'm not going to shock them. And they're, you know, I'm not going to be like shamed or laughed at or, you know, it's, it's something that, um, that only we, I think, get to experience. Is that and I really happen? wish that, that honestly I've said this so many times in in meetings I wish that everybody could have that you know I wish that everybody would go through the 12 steps or work on themselves the way that that we have yeah we had to totally wreck our lives to, to start doing that but like I tell my kids all the time, I I wish you would work the way work on and work on yourself the way that I have because I don't want you to wait till you're forty to to not care what other people think, to to love yourself no matter what, you know, to accept your flaws, like all those things. Accept other people's flaws. Don't judge them. Let them live their lives. Make sure your lane is clean. Like you know, like all those things. Like I wish everybody went through all that. I just wrote um uh, I just wrote a coaching program. Mm -hmm. Like no, I'm not a recovery coach because I can't charge people money to help them with their recovery because it just goes against everything that is ingrained in me. Um but I did write a coaching program and it's like the 12 steps for everyone else. Oh, I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. I and you know, it's it's interesting cuz it's like, well, what motivated me to want to do this work? Like what motivated you? Well, hopelessness, desperation. Um, we use the term incomprehensible demoralization. <laughs> yeah. Made me willing to do all this work. So I don't, yeah, I think the question is how to, how to sell everyday people on, like break yourself open and pull out all the pieces and then look at which ones you need and throw out which ones you don't. And then the ones that you do need, let's like shine them up and help you love them. And then we'll put them back in. <laughs> exactly. And see what kind of person you are, what version you are, you know? Yeah. And, and, oh, I hope that, I, I mean, that I'm excited for you to do that. That, I think that's amazing. I think that this world would be a better place if everybody did that, mm -hmm. you know, um, because, like it, it's funny because but before I was in recovery, I was oh boy, here I am wrecking my life, right? And knowing that I'm being a horrible person. And I was so judgmental, right? Like I would judge everybody by the way you were what what you were wearing, how you talked, you know, like like how you lived, like everything. And now mm -hmm. I look at I look at people and I'm just like, but like, yeah. I just accept them for who they are and just love them for who they are because that's what we're here for. We're here to love each other. Like, I don't care about your sexuality, your religion, how you live your life. You know, as long as you're not underneath my roof, wrecking my little serenity bubble, mm -hmm. then do you, you know, go do you if it makes you happy. Yeah. Uh, my, <clears throat> my last sponsor, she would call it her hula hoop. She's like, I only only get to judge things that are in my hula hoop I only get to try to control things that make it this close yeah and I'm like that makes sense to me yeah 100 <laughs> percent so uh as far as like when we first get sober um like I didn't go into an inpatient treatment program but I mean, I did an, uh, an intensive outpatient, right? I did an <laughs> IOP and um, I feel like my brain was too fried <laughs> to even absorb the info. You know what I mean? Like after just <laughs> years of abuse and they're trying to tell me all these things about, you know, my addiction and there was just, there's no way anything was getting in yet. Um, but I do, um, I do like to just talk to people about the importance of, 
recover not just treatment but recovery like the fact that we need both of them like you and i have been talking about you know the benefit of recovery in our lives but when like when people first decide they want to stop drinking like what was your path like? Like, did you choose to go inpatient? Like, so my, just a little uh, snapshot of my, my story is, so before I went into Ripple, I, um, I was a chronic relapser, but I had almost a year sober and, um, I had those thoughts, you know, like, am I really an alcoholic? You know, I think I can, I can drink and control it. And, um, I decided to, to test it. And within three months I would, I, I managed to, um, to show up to my job drunk. Um, they sent me home and my solution was to go get more alcohol. Um, I then wrecked my car got my third DWI in three months and um, I'm sitting in, in jail with my three, my third DWI, which my friends in recovery had, had, were just talking to me and was like, Randy, you're going to end up, you know, in jail for two years if you get another one, you know, and that's how strong addiction is, is that, you know, like I didn't care, you know, Um, or not that I didn't care. I couldn't stop you know, I couldn't stop drinking. And, um, so here I am sitting in jail and the thought crossed my mind, a drink would be nice right now. Mm-hmm. And that right there was the pivotal moment where I was like, I need help. Like this, this cannot continue. I'm going to either kill somebody or kill myself. Um, and so I got out and I got out on a Monday I called my friend. I knew she knew people. And I said, I need to get into to rehab. I had never heard of Ripple Ranch before. And she's like, she's like, um, we got you, we got you a bed. You just need to call them. So I got out on Monday. I was in Ripple by Friday. And it's funny now because, um, you know, when I'm talking to clients and they're asking how long the program is, you know, I'm like, and it's an average stay of 30 to 45 days. And that's what they told me, right. When I went in and I told them, I literally, I still remember looking at the nurse and I said, I'm going to be here for 45 days. And she was like, well, it's up to your insurance. I was like, I don't think you understand. I'm going to be here for 45 days. I'm not leaving. I'm getting this. And when I went into Ripple, I was so broken and so ready for sobriety. They could have told me to stand on the roof and say the alphabet backwards and, you know, do 10 jumping jacks while screaming my name. And I would have done it because I wanted sobriety so bad. You know, like I did not want to live this life anymore. I did not want to continue to hurt myself and hurt my family and hurt my kids. And I mean, at that time, at that point, my daughter wasn't even calling me mom. You know, she said I didn't deserve that name, you know, um, a lot of things. And and so I just knew at that time I wanted sobriety. I needed it. That's that beautiful gift gift of desperation. Yes. And I don't think people understand how beautiful when we say that, how beautiful it really is. Like it's, it's to us in recovery, we, we see someone desperate and we're like, yes, like, let's get them, hook them in. We got them, you know? And, and other people are like, why would you want someone to be desperate? And we're like, because that's when they're, they, they're ready. That's when they're willing. That's when they're open to let some light come in. Exactly. And that's what I tell some, you know, my clients when they're, when I'm talking to them on the phone, you know, all you, you don't have to be happy about going to rehab. No one's happy about going to rehab. You know, you don't have to be happy about it. But what you do need is you need a little bit of willingness and a little bit of openness just to hear what they have to say and take one day at a time. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's so hard to describe. And I guess that's why we just live. And I'm, you know, I'm really happy that people in recovery are willing to come on to the show and talk about their recovery because, 
it was somebody else talking about going to treatment that planted the seed that somebody like me could get sober because I didn't think that someone like me could do it. Like we all think that we're just mm -hmm. that exception to the rule and that we are unique and that we are different and that our circumstances are totally worse or better or whatever it is than everybody else's. And in reality, it's not that different. It really isn't. <laughs> You know, it really isn't. And just, yeah, I, <clears throat> it's funny you say that about coming and speaking because, because before, before I went to, to Ripple and really got recovery, you know, because yeah, I would, I, I was on, you know, almost a year sober, but I wasn't in recovery, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and so before I would not, you know, I wouldn't speak in meetings. Uh, if you ask me to say my story, uh -uh, I'm not getting up in front of people. You know, I'm not going to talk about, about where I've been. Like, you know, I'm not going to do that. It wasn't because I was nervous about doing it. It was because I was ashamed of, of myself, you know, and now the difference is, is because I've done that work and I'm truly working a program, you know, I'm able to, you ask me to tell me, tell you my story. I'll sit here and I'll tell you my story. You know, you want me to speak in front of, uh, in front of people. I'll go and, and speak in front of however many people I may not do it perfectly, but I'm going to, I'm going to tell my story because it's just like when we first got on this call, you said, you know, even if it only hits one person, mm -hmm. it's worth it. Yeah. Even if one person listens to this and says, oh, you mm -hmm. know what? I can relate to that. You know, then it was worth it. it. Then this, I I did my job. You know, I gave away what was given to me. Absolutely, because there's there's so many comparisons. Like I, you know, I'm a bartender still. I talk to a lot of bartenders. This podcast is not just for bartenders, but you know, it's kind of hard for people like people have this idea of like this rock bottom right and they think that you need to live under a bridge or that you don't have a car or you know that you have no money in the bank or you don't have a job or you know you drink out of a brown bag or this or this or that but it's like I mean I hit a lot of bottoms and kept digging and it didn't even seem like a bottom you know like living like couch surfing in my early thirties didn't seem like a bottom. Like it just seemed like part of the lifestyle. Yeah. Like the norm. Bartender. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's true. And, the, and, and it, you know, <clears throat> everybody's rock bottom is, is so different and looks different. And, and you know, um, I like in these things when they say, you know, the yet's, you know, be, I haven't done that yet, or I'm not like that person. I'm not an alcoholic because I don't have three DWIs yet. You know, well, I used to do that, all these yets. Now, I don't ever say that in my head when I hear someone that has done something that I haven't done. I'll literally tell myself, thank God I didn't do that. Yes. You know, thank God I didn't get, I, not that I didn't get to that point because I, I could easily, but thank God, you know, I didn't go, go outside running naked, you know, but I could have. Yeah. It could have happened, you know, because I'm no better than anybody on this planet. I, I, you know, I'm just somebody who, uh, when, when I had that thought in jail, who said, okay, enough is enough, you know, and, and that looks different. Some people, it, some people, it only takes, you know, like their wives or husbands saying you need help or their parents or whatever. And some people really need to wreck their lives and, and, I like, like I said, like, I'm not someone who, who judges. Like, okay. All right. Well, you know what? Okay. You did that. Now let's move past it. And let's, let's take, take the steps to get you into the treatment or outpatient or a meeting, or you want to sponsor. Okay. I'll sponsor you. You know, like, I like, let's, let's take the steps to move forward because you can't live in that past. Yeah. Because we get so used to living in our problems. And they propel us when we're in, like when we're drinking, like I can still remember, like just, you know, the things that I carried with me every day, like 
having been audited by the IRS and not like avoiding, you know, those bills like that was something that was always in my I called it my black trash bag that I hauled <laughs> around. And it wasn't just that it was also, you know, people and situations and, and traumas and issues and and all these things. But I lived like this defined everything, this big black just bag uh, it was like the size of I don't know like a dump truck uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> of all these things you know these problems and so it just made sense to live in the problem and then it was just always an excuse of why I couldn't do anything differently and it made sense why I dealt with things the way that I did was because mm -hmm. I mean man if you had all this but it's like everybody has that but setting down that drink and then getting into this work is what gives you a chance, like I said, it, to sort through those things and to set some down and to clean some up. And, uh, and like you said, so, you know, you just get to a point where you just stop focusing like, yes, there's a bunch of problems. Yes, that does suck that that happened. And now, and just taking that next step to just put one foot in front of the other, like to and do the next thing. Exactly. And that's it. You know, like my kids get so tired of hearing me say it because I say it all the time. You know, like they'll come to me with their problems and I'm like, OK, what? let's work towards the solution. Like, let's fix it, you know, or. You know, um, I just dealt with, you know, my stepson saying that he was feeling depressed and stuff. And, and I'm like, okay, but these are the things that, that are causing these emotions. And the great thing about it, the positive thing, are they, they're fixable. Like you, you have the power to make it better. So start make, taking those steps, you know, like, and like I was talking to my son, like, what are those, what, what, you don't have to make a huge goal. What are those little tiny goals to get you towards that huge goal? Because I know for me personally, when things are really, really big, if I'm just looking at the big picture the whole time, it's overwhelming, right? So we take these little steps, little baby steps. As long as I'm moving forward, I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And it was the same thing in, in recovery. As long as I'm doing the next right thing. And sometimes I didn't want to do the next right thing, but I continued to do the re next right thing because I knew I had to for my recovery. You know, I knew I had to, to get through, like I, I tell clients, you know, that, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, right? And the only way to get to that light is you have to go through that dark tunnel mm -hmm. and there is no shortcuts. You can't go around it. You can't go, you can't go over it. You can't go under it. You have to go all the way through. And I tell them, I said, I'm going to be, I'm going to be completely honest with you. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be days that you want to give up. There's going to be days that you feel torn down and broken. You're going to be crying. You're going to be yelling. But if you keep going, moving forward, just keep going. I promise you, you'll get to the end of that tunnel to that light, you know, and I, I just, I just, feel like that's what recovery is you start at that that the beginning of that tunnel and it looks scary and overwhelming but if you keep pushing forward you get to it and and I mean the way that my life is now I I never imagined being as happy as I am you know I've got both of my I'm from California but both, uh, both of my kids live in here in Texas with me I, um, I've got my grandbabies in my life. I'm married to, to my soulmate, you know, uh, I've got three beautiful stepchildren and, um, and life is good. You know, like, d do I have bad days? Of course I do. Do, do, are there days where, where I just like, I don't even know how I'm feeling because I'm human. Yes. But the great thing is I have my sobriety, I have my recovery, and it just, like, those, those coping skills and, the, and the, the things that I've learned about myself, like, I'm able to get through those bad days, and then the next day, it's like, okay, it's a new day, Let, let's start it, you know, like, I, I'm sure my team gets tired of, on Mondays, I send, or I send out uh, emails every morning, right, and on Mondays, instead of 
being like everybody else does, you know, oh, it's Monday. I'm like, it's my favorite time, my favorite day of the week. You know, it's new beginnings, new hope, new, you know, like new ways to spread light to other people. And it's just, I love that I look at life that way because I didn't for a very long time. And it's the greatest gift, isn't it? It is. It that really new, is. That new perspective, it's like new eyes. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it is... Uh, it, like my high now is, is my family and my clients and my team and, you know, and is sharing Ripple Ranch with other people or sharing the 12 steps and, you know, to my sponsees or being asked to go do a women's, um, a women's um, study for, for a sober living house. I'm like, well, you know, three years ago I was sitting there, I was living in sober living drinking, you know, like. And now I'm I'm going and I'm speaking to to other women and I'm just like thank I I thank God every day for for what I have you know and the neat thing is like you don't have anything that somebody else doesn't have like there's nothing like me and you like we're just people who just kept doing one foot after the other like going yeah. all the way through that tunnel that you described like I try to I try to let people know like I'm not better or worse or different I just did it I let it work in my life all the way all the way through yep and and that's the thing is like it's so funny that you say that you know that, that people you know because people who are in their their of addiction sometimes they're like oh you're just judging me and you think you're better than me and and no I don't I want to give you what I have I want to give you the tools I want you I want to give you the steps that that I just want to be a friend I just want to be hope for you that's it that's all I don't think I'm better than you because you can have what I have And I just want to give it to you. Just let me give it to you. I know. Just let me love you. <laughs> just hold still. <laughs> Fine. I promise. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a trip. I, I totally admire what you do. It's, it takes a special person because I just, I picture it and I, I don't think that I would love it. I think it, I would love it. And also I think it would be extremely challenging it is definitely challenging i had um i had great uh, mentors um you know my boss is is amazing and she um she's been patient with me like you know was she my very first day she had to walk out because i couldn't remember how to copy and paste so so it's like i can't right now you know um but I kept, and I kept coming back with work and I'm just like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this. And now, I mean, it's amazing. My story with Ripple, it really is, you know, and, and um, it, yes, I definitely have challenging days. Um, I hear a lot of um, really dark stories, you know, where people, people are and what they've been through. Um, but what, keeps me going with it is I know that once they get into Ripple, you know, if they allow them to, it, the team to help them, they're going to succeed and their life is going to be better. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of those. I wish that every single person that came into Ripple, you know, we had a hundred percent rate rating of, uh, of recovery. Right. But I also know too, that, it's not me. It's not my team. It's not, it's not the ripple staff. It, it's not any of them. It's the, the person isn't ready yet. You know, they haven't, mm -hmm. they haven't let that, they haven't hit that moment where it's like, I will do whatever, you know? And, um, but those ones that do succeed, those ones that I see on the alumni night page, that, oh, I've got two years or I've got, I got, I just collected my 60 days and my kids, I just got to see my kids today. You know, I, I feel good about it. because I was a part of that. Yes. Yes. And how, so how long did it take for you to start working there? So with me, with my journey into 
working with recovery. So it was funny because when I was a client, I told the operation manager, I said, I'm going to work here someday. And, um, and she was like, ah, yeah, okay. I would love to have <laughs> you on the team. You know, a lot, a lot of clients say that. And I said, okay. I said, I will, I'm going to come back and work here, you know? And, um, I didn't know how, I didn't know when. So I leave, I go through IOP. Um, I started working as a server again, cause that was the industry industry that I was in before. And, um, I ended up moving in with some other friends in recovery and um, I started working for this place called Hoven, Haven for Hope here and where, where they help um, homeless people and addicts and um, I was overnight staff so I was basically just helping them like get bedding and be in a safe spot for at night. And the one of the people that I lived with, he started working at a recovery center and um, I had I had maybe 90 days sobriety and, um, and they're like, no, we can't take her. You know, she needs to have at least a year. Well, I didn't give up on it. And then, uh, seven, uh, when I hit my step on the day I hit my seven months, I started working for that, that recovery, um, center as a tech. And then I went to an alumni meeting for ripple. And I just, cause I go like sporadically when I can, when it's there in my, uh, like, when it works for my schedule, you know, and, um, my old case manager was there and it happened to be his last meeting that he was running. And, um, he goes, Oh my gosh, Sarah Buckler wants you to call her. And I'm like, who's Sarah Buckler? Like, I, I don't know who she is. And he was like, he was like, well, she knows you and she wants to give you a job. And I said, what? And so, I, ended, I took me about two weeks to call her because I was happy at my other job okay. and I, uh, I called her and the very first thing she said, I'll never forget. She was like, why did it take you so long to call me? <laughs> and so I ended up going to an interview and they, and it was for admissions. And now I, I was like, oh my gosh, do I even, I don't know how to do my admissions. I haven't worked in an office in years, you know, and, and I ended up taking the job. It was about a year and a half after after um, I left Ripple. I was now working as admissions, and I have literally worked my way up from the bottom of the admissions totem pole to the manager. And my goal is to eventually become director of admissions. Sure. And yeah, so so that's my goal, and it's just it's been amazing. Like my team is definitely helped me with my, my journey with, in admissions. They've been patient with me. They've, they've, you know, guided me in the administrative side because I can talk about recovery all day long, you know, like I can tell you why you need recovery, but it was the administrative side that I didn't know, you know, and, and, um, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's mind boggling to sit there and think of how far I've come, you know, like I I've literally been with ripple a little over a year now and I've worked my way up to a manager. Yeah. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. I love it. Especially hearing that you were a server. I love hearing anybody that got out of the, <laughs> the service industry. <clears throat> yeah. I was a server for a long time and man, I sit there and I think cause I made good money as a server and I sit there and I think about all the money that I blew, <laughs> man, but, but you know, it, the crazy thing with me was serving it because people would ask me all the time, you know, like, is it hard to be around the alcohol? And it wasn't for me, it wasn't being around the alcohol that was hard. It was when I got off because my mind for, you know, seven to eight hours just was just like constantly go, 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 go into, you know, all, you know, oh, you got, you know, eight tables going, what do they all need? All, and you're just going, going, going. And then you get off and it's just like, okay. <laughs> like this is where I usually turn it all off. Uh-huh. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. I drank while I worked for the last several years. So I did miss it. But also I was so done that I was like, well, I just, 
can't fathom the thought of another drink ever because I hated my life so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and but then I think about it now because I was the same way. Like I, I literally, I woke up in enough time. Like I, I knew that they started selling alcohol at seven o'clock in the morning. I was at the gas station at seven o'clock in the morning. You know, like they knew me by first name. They kept my drink because they knew that I was going to to be there. There wasn't a day that I missed. And I literally, I had a constant buzz all day long like I had it down to a T on how I drank and now I think about it, I'm like how did I do like I have no idea how I did it I mean there was a point where I was working two jobs and 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 lived that way and I'm just like I couldn't I it it, it just exhausts me thinking about it now <laughs> yeah yeah I hear you I mean I was in Vegas so it was just kind of 24 hours that just there was never an inappropriate time for me to have a bottle of Tito's so I capitalized on that but yeah <clears throat> yeah I just I I look back at it and I'm like I know that that was me but also it doesn't even seem like that was me like your dad said that you know it, it is you and that this you was in there somewhere but I'm like man, she was drowning. Like, <laughs> yeah, big time. It's funny. Like I'll talk to my girls on my team and they're like, I can't picture you like that, Randy. And I'm like, yeah, I was like big time. Like I, I didn't, I didn't care anything. I just wanted to drink and I knew I needed to work to drink. And, and so I just made sure that I had enough for my bills and enough for my alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, I had somebody else covering that. So I just had to like pay for, <laughs> I just had to pay for, you know, what I needed as far as like drinking. And, you know, I, I also substituted so I could drink longer. So yeah, but um, it's just interesting. Like I talk to people now and they're like, I can't even picture, you know, like I have really ghetto tattoos, like, like uh -huh. thuggish tattoos. <laughs> And people are like, they don't, they don't match your personality. And I'm like, well, I can assure you that she is still here. <laughs> you don't need to invite her out at all. Exactly. <laughs> like, I remember when people, when, you know, they would tell me when I would drink, they were just like, Randy, we, we love you. But when you drink, we don't, we can't stand to be around you you know, and, oh, that would break my heart, like, oh, like, talk about a stab to, to the heart, right, because yeah. I'm just, like, or that feeling of waking up in the morning, and who did I text, who did I call, what did I do last night, where am I at, why am I, you know, where are my shoes, <laughs> like, yeah, like, and just that feeling of, like, that guilty conscious of just knowing that you did something, and just waiting for the bottom to fall out, waiting to find out what horrible thing you did or what embarrassing thing you did or. Yeah. And I, having and no I, freaking clue ever. Exactly. And then having people have to tell you like, that's the worst, you know, is, oh, do you even know what you did last night? Oh gosh, please don't tell me. <laughs> but they would. A drink. <laughs> You know, like, like not having those moments anymore is so refreshing. I love that. I love, I love that we're sober and we get to look back on those things and oh, just not have that be a current part, like of reality. And like you yeah. said, you got, you know, you got your family back. You have a life that you could not imagine. I mean, I totally identify with that. I would have never pictured myself in Texas, happily married, like healthy and telling other people to get sober. Like I was the hater on AA. Like I would have my customers get together and we would call ourselves Alcoholics Alotomous. <laughs> How the tables have turned. Right? Thank goodness. Yes. So... Do you have, um, I do like to ask people, do you have like a morning routine that you do faithfully? Well, um, I do have a morning routine. <laughs> so I make sure that I get up at least um, an hour to an hour and a half before I have to start work. You know, um, that gives me time to have 
my moments to myself, you know, the house is quiet. Um, I, the very first thing I still, people don't believe me, but every single day I, when I wake up, I tell myself for today, I'm going to stay sober for the, for the next 24 hours. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen a week from now, but today I commit to staying sober. I do that every single morning. I say that to myself every single morning before I get out of bed because it's worked. You know, and mm -hmm. and um, so I start myself off that way. Um, then I get my my coffee, and then I I have my time with with God. Um, I'll read my devotional, and um, I'll just take soak in that that time to kind of reflect in the morning on you know um, what I want to achieve for the day, or if things are going on, you know, with my, my kids or my family or whatever, you know, like just take that time to, to use the quietness that I used to hate, mm. you know, um, to use that to my advantage before the day starts getting hectic and I have to, you know, dive into, to everything that I have going on for the day. I love that. And that's funny because mine is really similar to where I get up extra early so that I have time to just be Yes, it's like meditation. It's prayer. It's just connecting. It's connecting with that intuition. It's setting the intentions for the day. And I love that you do that too, because it absolutely makes a difference. It does. And it's, and it's so crazy because I used to not be a morning person. Like I would have never oh. woke like if I would wake up like 10 minutes before I had to, to, to be ready for anything. Right. Be, mm -hmm. And now, like I said, like the silence isn't deafening to me anymore. It is, it is a gift, you know, because life is so busy and so hectic and, you know, there's so many things going on, especially with having a big family, like I do, you know, that, I soak in that, that silence and that time that I get to reflect. I love it. Well, Randy, we're running out of time. So I want to thank you so much for coming to talk to me and for sharing, you know, parts of your story and sharing the message of recovery of hope and of ripple ranch recovery. Um, I definitely have a lot of people reaching out, um, looking for options here in the state of Texas. So I'm happy to have, you know, a, a contact to be able to send people your way. Oh, I love it. Send all the people my way. <laughs> I will get them in. If they're, they're ready, I am ready. And I really appreciate what you do. And, and you know, I really hope that that coaching uh, program soars for you. Like, I would love to hear some follow up on uh, how it goes with, you know, with just you know, what we call normies, you know, yeah. and see, see how it, how it works. And, um, you know, just thank you for what you do. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my experience. Yes. I'm so happy to meet you. And I'm sure this won't be the last time we talk. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> and uh, I will, for everyone listening, I will include Randy's contact info in the show notes. And um, if you have any questions, I will make sure you have a way to contact her. If you need to contact me, you can reach me on Facebook at the Sober Bartender Facebook group, on Instagram at the Sober Bartender Podcast, and on YouTube at the Sober Bartender. And yes, I put out new episodes every Wednesday. If you're enjoying the show, I implore you, please take time to rate, review, follow, like, subscribe. If there's somebody you think would benefit, would appreciate what we're talking about here, please forward this to them. Please share it. Um, and I, I will talk to you guys next week. Bye. <laughs>